So, uh, yeah, just speaking of that, uh, one of the board members, uh, I sit on the board of, of Hope Extended, which is the U.S. side of Casa de Fe, and uh, he just came back, one of the board members just came back from there and, and sent out some pictures. They got all the plumbing in, all the electrical in the first floor, and they're ready to pour the first floor floor. They got the second floor is poured. They're getting ready to pour that first floor, but all the electrical and plumbing is all in for down there. So that's so exciting uh, to watch and see what God's doing there. All right, so we are in the book of Acts. And last week, um, we left off with Peter going to preach in Caesarea to a Roman Gentile centurion. Big, big, huge step, not only for Peter, but for the church. Because up to this point, their main focus had been on Jewish believers. And Peter had a bit of a hard time. Because Peter's like, going, I'm really comfortable over here in my lane. I'm a Hebrew Jewish believer, and I'm cool with, with being in that lane. And then God forced him out of that, and he said, I want you to go over here and talk to the Greek Jewish believers. And he says, ah, okay, all right. But then when God said, I want you to go speak to a Roman Gentile unbeliever, Peter's like going, not too sure. And God had to give him a big old swift kick in the pants and move him up the coast. And he went to Caesarea and he preached there. That was, that was last week. This week we're going to come to the continuation of God moving not only with Jewish believers but with Gentile unbelievers. So that God's moving in a different front now. He's saying, I've come to the the Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit. God is beginning to work. And Antioch is one of those places where God is working in a huge way. And that's what we're going to look at today in this 11th chapter, the last part of uh, Acts 11. And I want you to see the map here. And we see down here is Jerusalem. And Acts 1 8 said, What? You shall be my you shall be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, Judea, and then he said, Samaria. So just north here, Samaria. <coughs> and Philip went up to Samaria. And then we know that we had believers in Damascus, because that's where Saul was headed to when God changed his life. When God came down and and met him on the road to Damascus, and he got saved. And so we had believers there. And then, whoops, sorry, hit the wrong one there. We'll go back a couple. Wow, how far did I go? <coughs> so then Peter is sent up here to Caesarea, and that's where it first goes to the Gentiles. Now Caesarea is a seaport. It's a Roman seaport. Rome is way over here. Way somewhere right, right about there. It's way, so they would leave Caesarea, and if they were going north, they would sail to Cyprus. If they were going south, they would sail to a place called Cyrene, which is over here. <coughs> Excuse me. So as, as this word is getting out with these Gentiles, it's, the word is spreading. And everywhere they would go, this word would be carried not just to the Jews now, but also to the Gentiles. So that's where we find ourselves today uh, in Acts chapter 11. And we're going to come to verse 19 to 21 and, and read what it has to say to us. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But 
There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who had come, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also preaching the word of Jesus Christ. And the, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number of those who believed turned to the Lord. <clears throat> so we have this movement, and the interesting part is that between verses 19 and 20 is a number of years. In verse 19, what did we see? We saw it says, when, when the first persecution came, when Stephen was killed and Saul went out, the folks went from Jerusalem and they ended up in Antioch. And who did they preach to? The Jews only. The Jews only. We're, we're, see, because we like to preach to those that are like us. Right? I mean, they talk our language. They look like us. We can relate. And so the Jewish people that were leaving Jerusalem went up and they were speaking to the Jews only. Well, then we have beginning in verse 20, it says, but there were others. Now, I want you to understand how many years is between 19 and 20. What happened with Saul? He persecuted the church. The church started to scatter. He went up to Damascus, remember, in chapters 7 and 8. He goes up to Damascus. He gets saved. He spends three years kind of in Damascus and out. We called it the backside of the desert university where God was teaching him. And he was there for three years. There was an assassination attempt. They, they took him from uh, from there and brought him from Damascus and brought him down to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they didn't want to accept him. And then there was another death threat. And so they took him over to Caesarea, put him on a ship and sent him back to his hometown of Tarsus. And he stayed there for seven years. So the but is somewhere in this 10 year period. It's not this happened and then this happened. There's a big amount of time. So what happens in the but? Also, Peter does what? Peter takes the gospel to the Gentiles in, in Caesarea, and they, they receive it there, and it starts going, whew, 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 goes up to Cyprus, common stop, goes down to C Cyrene, common stop goes to Antioch, common stop. Because they didn't have, when they sailed into the Mediterranean, they didn't have huge ships like we have today. They had much smaller boats, and so they would stay along the sea, sea ports, or they would go out to the island, and they would meet there, and then they would go on. They didn't want to be too far from land in case a storm came up. And so the gospel begins to go out. And now we have a two-pronged approach. We have the Jewish people that are preaching to the Jewish people. And we have the Gentiles that are preaching to the Gentiles. And in verse 20 it says what? It says, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, preaching the word, the, preaching the Lord Jesus. They're preaching to Greek-speaking people. Now, it's not what we would call the Hellenistic Jews. These are, these are Gentile Greek people that, that they're preaching to. The, the gospel is spreading. And now we have a church. Antioch has this diverse church that has both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. <gasps> they don't talk like us. They don't look like us. 
They're different. They have different, they eat different stuff. They don't eat fried chicken. You know? If you ever been to a potluck in the South, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, or here. <laughs> they, they're different. And remember what the title of our, our message was today, the Antioch Church, How to Grow a Church. Uh, if a church is going to grow, it has to be diverse. Now, I'm not just talking about race or ethnicity, even though that is important. I'm talking about we need to be diverse in all areas. We need to have older people, and we've got to have younger people. If you don't have, if you have all, you know, we can be really comfortable with, with all, you know, all this gray hair, and it's like, oh, this is all cool. You know, they all like the same music, you know. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number. Right? And we all know what a hymn number is. We can get really, really comfortable having the same, you know, the, we look around and, and, oh, they look just like me. But we need to have the younger family. I love it when, when we have our kids in church in first service, the kids stay in the service. We don't have a Sunday school for them. And I love it when they start acting up. That means we got kids here. It's okay. You know, you, you'll see, you know, every once in a while we'll be, we'll be up here and we got some young families that are part of our worship team and one of the kids is up there camped out up on the stage and I'm like going, somebody, well, that's, that's awfully disturbing to the worship. I'm like going, I'm going, I'm glad they're here. I mean, what better place to get you get blessed than sitting at the feet of their mom or dad while they're worshiping? So we have to have this, we have to have generational diversity because we need those with the gray hair, or in my case, the no hair, to teach those who are the younger ones coming up. We need to have the Gentiles. We need to have the bikers. We need to have the folks who are recovering from addiction. And we need to have a diversity in economy, you know, it, you can walk, I've walked into churches and everybody had their three-piece suit on and, and, you know, there was all, you know, it was like who, who, it was who's who, how do you dress, right? You know, everybody's looking like, oh, wow, you know, they've been, they, look, they got a new car. You know, it's like keeping up with the Joneses on the Christian level. And God says, you know what? It's not like that. James talks about, don't show partiality. He says, when the poor man comes in, when the slave comes in, and he wants to sit on the front row, that's where he gets to sit. You don't put, you don't save the front row for your biggest donor. But we also need the, we need the people like Barnabas who can sell property and say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to use this for God's work. There should be an economy because that's where God begins to work. When there's, a, when there's a diversity of economy, that gives those people who have the gift of giving, they can come alongside somebody and say, I, hey, I understand you have a need. I love that. I've watched that happen here in this church quite often. There will be a need, and somebody will come in and they'll say, uh, Pastor, I don't want them to know about this, but... Uh, here is a check or here's cash to pay for, for what they need. And it's significant. And he said, but don't tell them. And then I, then I call the person up or I usually I, I send an, an email or a text and say, hey, stop by my office. I got a blessing for you. And, and I'll hand them, you know, exactly what they said they needed. You see, when you have, when you have, different economies, that allows God to work. When you have people that are going through different seasons in life that need somebody to come alongside them, that person who has the gift of mercy or that person who has the gift of encouragement can come alongside those people. We need to have a diversity of economy. We need to have a diversity of ages. We need to have, our church can't look like Everybody's the same because we're not. 
and that allows the church to grow. And that's what was happening in Antioch. The Jewish believers and the Gentile believers were getting together, and it, we see in this passage that many, many, many people were getting saved. And it really didn't matter what they looked like. It mattered most of all what God was doing in their life. And because so many people were getting saved in Antioch, the Jewish church down in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church, decided they need to come check this out. Now, they didn't send an apostle to lay on hands for the filling of the Holy Spirit. That had happened for all Gentiles when Peter preached in Caesarea. And you won't see that every time they stepped out farther now, it's gone to the Gentiles. You won't see that as being a separate action any longer. When they got saved, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as it moves out, they're, they're sending now somebody to encourage them. So let's look at 22 to 26. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Barnabas. Yeah, I love Barnabas. He's a great guy. I mean, I wish I had somebody nickname me Barney. I actually had a teacher who got my name wrong in high school. He called me Barney, but that's... Yeah, his name was Barnabas. We find him in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Now Joseph, the Levite, Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated to mean son of encouragement. What a great nickname. His name is son of encouragement. And they pick him because why? Look where he's from. He's from Cyprus. Where did we see Cyprus? Cyprus is just off the coast from Antioch. That would have been common for him to hop a boat, go from Cyprus to Antioch, and go wherever he needed to go. He knew the people. He knew the language. He knew the customs. Why not send him back? He also has certain gifts. Gifts that have been developed. Barnabas' gift of motivation was exhortation. And his gift of ministry was as a pastor. Okay, now you're saying, what, what are you talking about? These? So come, come to the gifts class, the spiritual gifts class. We just taught it about a month or so ago. And you find that in Romans chapter 12, it gives us the gifts of motivation. What is it that charges your bank? Where are you most effective in ministry? Some of you, I can sit and I can point out exactly what your gift is because I've been around you long enough. He had the gift of exhortation. That's why they gave him the nickname. That was his motivation. He loved it. Now, he gave, at one point, we'll see, if we looked back in Acts, you'll remember that Barnabas was the first one or one of the ones, to sell property in Cyprus. He sold his property and gave it to the apostles to minister to all the people. He wanted to encourage people. There were all kinds of people that didn't have resources. He said, you know what? God saved me, and I want to I use this, and it freed him up. We're going to see how Barnabas is turned loose because of his willingness to give that. But 
We also see Barnabas when Saul comes down to Jerusalem. Three years has gone by. They still don't trust him. This is the guy that went around killing people. This is the guy that threw people in jail. You think we're going to trust him? Barnabas is the one that comes to Saul and says, Hey, Saul, tell me your story. There are t- people who are, have the motivational gift of, ex- of exhortation typically are good listeners. They want to hear your story. What's life, what's life in, with you? How, how are things going? And sometimes that's, they'll just sit there and listen because you need to tell your story. And when you're hurting, I'm, I'm telling you, when you're hurting and you hold that story in, you're holding your own hurt in, but the person who has the gift of exhortation comes along, tell me your story, and you go, Bleh. <laughs> Call it, <laughs> yeah. verbal vomit. That's what I call them. You just let it out because somebody finally is, is, you know, instead of saying, hey, how are you this morning? Fine. Oh, okay, great. See you later. You know, they say, how are you today? Ah, oh, been a crappy week. Been a, a th- bad day. <laughs> Tell me about it. Let's go, over, let, let's go over here in a quiet corner and tell me how things are going. And then they, sit, they, they come alongside of them, they pray, and they don't just leave it there. Barnabas and Saul were together for 14 years altogether. He was Barnabas had the gift of exhortation. That was his motivation. He loved it, and that's what he went to do. He had the gift of ministry. This is from Ephesians chapter 4. His gift, there's five gifts of the ministry. His gift was as a pastor. As a pastor, as a shepherd. He's one who, who, who leads the sheep, who correct, you know, oh, hey, you're getting a little bit, come on, come on, come on back. Come on back with the foal, okay? Oh, that one's a little bit, oh, that one's got some burrs in the, oh, let me take care of that. Let me get the anointing oil and take care of that sore spot. He's a pastor. That's his gift of the ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, and he gave some as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Apostles is what we call today missionaries, right? They're sent ones. That's what apostle means. They're sent ones. Did you notice what was happening? Oh, we have some people over here from Cyprus, and we have some people down here from Cyrene. They're coming from all over the place, and they're missionaries. And you know what they're going to do? Antioch becomes the center for sending missionaries out. Not only are missionaries coming in, so they have sent ones. They have missionaries. Prophets are our preachers. They're the ones who, who take the word of God and, and challenge our hearts. They obviously had some evangelists because they're the one. I mean, did you see? And many were coming to the Lord. People were getting saved on a regular basis. The evangelists were active in the church. We saw Barnabas acting as a pastor but we, we need a teacher. We need a teacher. Oh, Barnabas thinks, I know a really good teacher. His name's Saul. He sat under Gamaliel, the Hebrew rabbi Gamaliel. He is, is well known as knowing the Old Testament Oh, the Jews will love this because he's, he's, he's a Hebrew, as he would say himself, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But where's he from? He's from Tarsus. Oh, he knows Greek. Oh, and by the way, he just happens to be a Roman citizen. But his talent is in what? Teaching. He went to the backside of the desert university. And God taught him how to teach the Old Testament relating to him, relating to Jesus Christ. And so what is, so Barnabas is, is realizing, 
I need to go get Saul. He's 90 miles away in Tarsus. So he says, hey guys, we'll be back in a few weeks. He makes the trip up, gets, gets Saul, he brings him back. And what do they do? They teach together, Saul teaching, and Barnabas pastoring. What a combination. Now, this, is a, this could be costly for Barnabas. Because Barnabas, I mean, he's got a good thing going here, right? He's got the fastest growing church in Antioch. Oh, hey, look what's going on. I could sit back here and, and, and people can pat me on the back because all of these people are getting saved. But he says, no, they need to be taught. Why? Why did he need a teacher? Because you take all five of these gifts to do this. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. It takes all five of those people in the church to make that happen. And he knew they needed Saul. So he makes the trip. Bring Saul back. Willing to step aside and say, you do the teach. Saul, you're much better than me. That takes a big person to step aside and say, hey, if you want to be taught, you go and listen to Saul. I'll encourage you. I'll do my part. But we needed all of those to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, a little application. Who are you? What? You're the saints. You are this. You're the equipping of the saints. You're the saints that they're equipping. That's what they did for the work of service. He said, he said I, we want to equip you for that. And so Barnabas, using his gift, and Saul using his gift, They, they equip this church, and we're going to see how this works out here in just a minute in Acts 12, or 11, 27 through 30. Now, at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would be certainly a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders." We have a guy by the name of Agabus. He is a prophet. Now, I, I said before, I said that the prophet was the preacher, right? The one who forth tells. That's what I do. I take the scripture and I forth tell it. I give it out to you. Hopefully to encourage you, to, to get you excited about what God wants to do. But during this time, there was also prophets, and you won't see many of them. Agabus is one of the few that are mentioned. Agabus comes down, and he foretells, right? He's telling about the future. God, through the Holy Spirit, says, hey, there is a famine coming. It's coming over all of the world the world as they knew it wasn't very big. But he, he said, it's coming. Now, this we could, if we tie this to chapter 12 with the, with the killing of the martyr of James, we know that this is about 44 A.D. And 46 A.D., is recorded a massive famine. 
two years. It's going to take a couple years for this famine to reach them. But they say, listen, we need to do something. And the Antioch church said, let's give. The Antioch church was filled with givers. They said, yeah, it's two, two years from now. It's not only going to affect them, but it's going to affect us. But we need to give. Why? Couldn't they be prepared also? Well, remember the state of the church in Jerusalem. They've gone through severe persecution. Most of them are Jewish people who have lost their, their homes, their jobs, because they left the Jewish faith and followed Jesus. They were poor. And so these Antioch believers said, okay, let's take a collection and let's send it down to them so that they can be prepared ahead of time. Two years, remember, it's coming in two years. Let's get them prepared. Let's let them buy food now, let's grain or whatever they need now while we know it's cheap before the famine hits. Be prepared. Oh, somebody else had that idea before, didn't they? Guy by the name of Joseph. There's going to be seven years of bad, or seven years of, of good, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So while we have the seven years of good, let's stock up before we have seven years of bad. Pretty smart idea. The Antioch church says, hey, let's send them down some money ahead of time before things get rough. Not only were they filled with givers, but they were filled with givers. Remember, this is a very diverse, and so I'm assuming they were diverse uh, economically also, and said, that God, they gave how? Proportionately. You see, a lot of times, you know, can every, if everybody will give $10, we'll have enough. Well, not everybody can give $10. Some people can give $10 and some people give, a, give $1. Some people may be able to give $50 or $100. And others may be able to give 5 He says it's proportional. As a matter of fact, this is an Old Testament concept. In Deuteronomy 16, 17, it says, Every man shall give as he is able, okay, according to what? the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. Isn't that awesome? As God blesses me, I give. If God blesses me more, I give more. God's going to, God's, and, and God will just keep on blessing you as you give. In 2 Corinthians 8, when Paul was talking about the Macedonians, he said this, for I testify according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Do you see what God, he said, listen, these Macedonians, they didn't have the money to give, but they believed they had faith that if they gave, God would take care of them, and God did. It was such a blessing to them to give that they begged for the opportunity. Hey, if you ever hear me, if somebody, somebody comes to you and says, hey, uh, God stole me, or, or here, I want to give you this gift. And you're like going, oh, no, no, I don't need it. And I'll tell you, you know what I'll tell you? Don't rob them of their blessing. Because if God's laid on them heart, their heart to give you something or to do something for you, then they're saying, ah, I want God to bless me. Not really. They just know that it's an after. It, it, it is what happens because they give. They know that. So don't, don't say, oh, no, I'm okay. We'll make it through. Allow them to receive that blessing that God's going to give them. 
But I want you to notice the last part of verse 5. And they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. You see, we, some people will talk about, oh, I, I give to my church. And they'll write a check faithfully, faithfully every month. They'll write that check every month. But then when the pastor says, hey, we have a need of somebody to do something, to physically take care of a need, sitting on her hands. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. That would, you know, that would, you know, I would have to talk to somebody. I would have to do something, you know, with my gift that God gave me. You know, and, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. And I love to watch as God uses, uses people. Yesterday, I, I, I was down, uh, Deb Powell, I'd seen Deb Powell on Thursday, and she she, Deb Powell is the head of, uh, CEO of Love, Inc. And she said, hey, you know, I said, what's going on? And she says, oh, we're having a resource fair over here on Hill Street. And, uh, and I, I, my driver, she has, a, she has a big truck and she has a 16-foot trailer, enclosed trailer. She says, my driver for my truck is out of town. I said, that's fine. I'll come, I'll come drive for you when, when do you when do you need me. Saturday morning, 7 o'clock. Okay, I'm, I'm usually up about that time anyway. I meet her down there and, and get the big truck. And we, you know, it, it even has one of those. Now, you have to remember, my truck's 2008. They didn't put cameras on trucks back then. I, I get in this thing. The, the uh, gear shift is a knob. And uh, there, there's, you push a button to start it. And when I put it in reverse, there's a backup camera. And it shows you exactly where the ball is. I mean, it's sweet. I'm like going, cool, this is easy. Boop, you know, back right up, you know. Hook it up, off we go. And if you've ever been around Deb, you, you know this, because she works with Deb every month. She hangs up, Joanne, wave your hand, Joanne. Joanne hangs up these clothes every month. If you want to have a fun time, go see Joanne. She'll help you. They just, it takes about an hour and a half just hanging up clothes. So we get there, and of course, there's like two other people there. Because we're way early, because she has to, she's doing this clothing giveaway. And uh, so I back the truck right up, right where it's supposed to be, and thinking, okay, it's 725. I got lots of time. I can go have breakfast. And Deb says, well, would you mind, you know, just helping unload till people, other people get here. And we open up this six, 16-foot trailer, and it is top to bottom, right? Boxes and boxes of clothes and racks of clothes and, and, and racks that have to be set up. They got this. And so I'm like unloading, and I'm unloading, and, and, and some people are starting to show up, so they're helping to move stuff around. And then we get to the front of the trailer, and there's two canopies, 10 by 20 canopies. He said, would you mind? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's just now 8.30, no problem. I don't have to be any place till 10. So <laughs> I'm like, so I'm out there just sweating, beating off, you know, just <laughs> putting this, and it's like, A, part A goes into part B, and, and how many part Bs do you have? And so I finally, I get one set up, and finally, some other people had shown up. So what took me a half hour to set up one, we set up in 10 minutes. The second one, we got it all set. And I'm like going, well, it's just now 9.45. I, I, I made my 10 o'clock appointment. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's awesome because you see all these people come in, and I know these people. And I know their circumstances. And a lot of them are coming coming out of addiction, they're coming out of homelessness, they're coming out of all these, and God has restored them, and they're just like, oh yeah, we're giving back now, because God has given, God has taken care of me, so well, I just want to give back. They gave first of themselves, it was awesome to watch that happen. Now, 
I have said this several times, and I wanted to put it on the screen so you don't forget it. You will be amazed at how much God will let pass through your hands if it does not stick. You will never be able to outgive God. When you start giving, and I'm not just talking about physical cash money, even though cash money is, is part of it. When God, when you begin to say, okay, God, use me, and, and God says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something. I, don't hold on to it. Don't hold it tightly. Let it go. And then God says, oh, you were, you were faithful with a little. Here's a little more. And here's a little more. And here's a little more. And pretty soon you're going, okay, we're, I need some place to give this to. I don't have any more. You know, I, I've given every place. And God will say, oh, well, here, let me open up this door over here. And, and, and shovel it that way. God, if once you allow God to start using you, God begins to open up doors here and there and everywhere. Well, this church, they knew how to give. The last thing I want you to see is that their, the Antioch church leadership came from within. Okay? God sent them Barnabas. Barnabas went and got Saul and brought him in. But, but how long did they stay? A year. I want you to notice at what happens in verse 30. They took up the contribution. It says, and this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. They said, thank you for coming. You've taught us. You've, you've trained up our teachers. You've trained up our pastors. You've trained up our evangelists. You've trained up our, our preachers. You've trained up our missionaries. You've done what you came to do. Now it's time to leave. You guys need to go someplace else. And they're going to do that again later on. We'll see in the book of Acts where they send them out again. This was one of the greatest missionary churches. They didn't want to keep all this really good leadership, the people that were talented in teaching. And they kept sending them out. Teach somebody else. We're okay. We have established this. Remember earlier I had mentioned Ephesians chapter 4 and the five gifts of the ministry. I believe that it is our responsibility as the church to train up our own people, to train up our own missionaries, to train up our own pastors, our own preachers, our own evangelists, our own missionaries. That's our job. What does it say? The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so as we reach out, how do we do that? How do we do that? We invest. Remember it says, and they gave first of themselves. You know what that means? That means if you have a gift of teaching, that you need to start looking around and saying, who else has a gift of teaching? Let me, let me bring them alongside of me and show you how to teach. And then turn them loose. If you have the gift of service, well, it's really, really, if you have the gift of service, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I can do this. I get, sometimes I get, anybody get frustrated when you're doing something? And uh, somebody says, well, I want to help, especially a kid. I want to help. And you know that it's going to take you twice as long to do it if you have to teach them. I'd rather do it myself, Right? My dad was the, was the ultimate in saying, okay, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And, he, and I know he was probably going, oh, man, it's going to take me forever to get this done. But he would be very faithful. I mean, he'd give me a hammer 
and it'd take me 10 times what it would take him to drive a nail. But he taught me. And that's part of it. It's investing yourself. If you have a gift, find somebody else who has a gift and teach them. When I was, when I was growing up in, in, a, in the church, the, the first one to do this for me was Pastor Matt Flood. Pastor Matt Flood, he came to me and he said, Hey, Ben, I think you have the gift of teaching, or the gift of preaching. I believe God wants you to be a preacher. And he says, I, I want you to do uh, our youth service. I was 15 at the time. There were a number of other young men in our church that were older than I was, but he picked me. And, and so I, I'm like, okay. I took Matthew chapter 24. I prepared. I had like, like I thought, two hours worth of preaching, and I preached them all in 15 minutes. And, and Matt, you know, later on he said, hey, you did a good job, you know, and gave me some little pointers. And, and Matt, would, Matt would call me up and he'd say, hey, can I pick you up after school and take you out to lunch? And so, uh, you know, we would go to usually a and and Matt had this big, bright red uh, Impala with a white vinyl top. So you knew, I mean, everybody at school knew that the preacher's coming to pick up, you know, it's like, so we would go to A&W and we'd, we'd, we'd get food and we'd sit there and talk for a while. And of course, I lived out in Waterloo. And so Matt would say, hey, uh, on the way home, I need to stop and, and make a visit. Uh, why don't you come in with me? And I'm a 15-year-old kid, right? And it may be one of our shut-ins. It may have been somebody that was, uh, you know, dealing with something. And, and so I would sit there very quiet because I had no clue what to say. So I'd just sit there very and listen. You know what he was doing? He was training me to be a pastor. He was teaching me with first-hand knowledge, this, this is how you do things. I remember the first time I walked in, uh, Dan Allen, who had been my pastor here, it was in Washington, D.C. I went up to see him. I was getting ready to fly home, and I spent the night at his house. And he says, oh, on the way home from the airport, we need to stop at the hospital. And, and this lady was, was literally, she was dying in the active stages of dying. And he, he said, come on. You're training to be a pastor. This is part of it. And I watched as he prayed over this woman. These were men that invested. Bob Seals, some, Hunter, I mentioned earlier. You guys were, why do I give, why do I have Hunter preach on Palm Sunday? Because Bob Seals, my first pastor as an associate, allowed me to preach on Palm Sunday. And, and it was such a big honor uh, that I, I'm like, Hunter, this, is one, this one's yours, because there's a lot of pastors. I've been around a lot of pastors who would say, oh, no, this is a biggie. This is one of the biggies. I, I don't give this away. But that was, and, and I, as these pastors, Pastor Donnie, Bain, who took me when I was broken, and I walked into the back of the church, and I said, right on the very back row. And Donnie said to me, he had, he, somebody had said, he's coming to visit your church. Let me give you a little bit of the backstory." And Donnie came and he, he said, listen, you take as long as you need to heal, but when you're done, when you're ready, when you are healed, you come see me because there's a place of ministry here for you. Those were all people who brought me to where I am today because they invested their time in me. There may also be another investment that you can make, and that's with the young people here. You see, my daddy was a, uh, he was a graveyard worker in the mill so that he could get 50 cents an hour uh, differential to work graveyard. And when I was going, my, when I got ready to go to school, my uncle called from back, he lived in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And he said, Ben, if you'll go 
to a Christian college, I will pay your first year's tuition. Because he knew there's no way mom and dad could pay for it. Private college, what are you thinking? And, uh, and he did. He paid for my first year. And sometimes we need to make a physical, uh, a, a financial investment in training our kids, training those who are coming up, because if we want, we want missionaries, you know how long it takes to get on the mission field? If you have to go to mission school, you have to go to language school, they need support. And that's hard for an 18, 20, 25-year-old person to come up with it. We need to make those investments, those financial investments, because I believe that we have the capability, we have the gifting within the church to train up the next generation. We just sang about that, didn't we? Are we the generation that is going to move this, the word of God forward? And I believe with all my heart that we can do that within the church. That, that a church will grow because it grows from within. Well, we're going to come to our time of communion. And as we come to communion, the thing that rings true to me is investment. What are you willing to invest for God? Jesus took 12 guys common people, fishermen, tax collectors. Just 12 of them, and he said, I'm going to invest in you. And I'm going to invest in you for three and a half years, and then I'm going to leave, and I'm going to leave all of the future that I'm dying on the cross for. I'm going to leave that all in your hands. I'm going to invest in you, and then I'm leaving. I'll send the Holy Spirit. But it's going to be your job to build the church. Now, I want you to understand, nobody had any clue out of those 12 on how to build a church. It hadn't been done before. And, and Jesus said, I'm going to invest in you, these 12 men. And that's when at the Last Supper, as he sat with them, he said, I've invested in you. I've done all of this investment. Now it's yours to take. 